Today I'd like to talk to you about uh, something that may or, or may not have come across your mind, but many people don't really have an answer when somebody comes to them and says, why are you a Christian? Why do you believe what you believe? How do we not know that the book that you claim is so holy was just not something that was written a few thousand years ago by a bunch of guys that just kind of like sat around a campfire with the camels tied up and decided, hey, let's just make up a bunch of stuff and just wrote it out. How do you know that your book is real? And they'll say, because my book's a holy book. But you know, somebody from Islam, they'll say, hey, we got a holy book. And they say, yeah, but we, we worship a, a, a Savior who came to this earth and wore sandals and lived in the Mideast. And they say, well, we do too, you know. And, and you, you, you try to explain to them why your book is real, but they have their books. All these other religions have their books. What makes our book any different? What makes the Holy Bible the Holy Bible? Well, I think there's several things we need to understand. One thing we need to understand is our book was given to us. It was actually given to the Hebrew people, to the uh, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, to Israel, as a holy writing in a holy language. And I think here's the key. Our book was written in Hebrew. And the Old Testament, the portion we're talking about, was originally written in Hebrew. Hebrew is God's language, and I believe that I can show you that today. I can prove some things to you today. I can show you that God's language is different from any other language and that there is nothing else like Hebrew. Let's put the first slide up. And today we're going to talk about the Hebrew language and the New Testament church. Now, we know that actually through the Hebrew language, I believe that we can prove the existence of God. Let's, let's go to the next slide. I want to quickly show you something. This right here is a word wheel. And the only reason I have this up, in fact, after I gave this message one time, Loretta said to me, she said, why didn't you explain all of this? Well, because this would take us an hour or two, just this one slide. What I want to show you is that the Hebrew language is intricate. The Hebrew language is not like any other language. Every word in the Hebrew language means something. Every letter means something. And it's not like English or French or Japanese where when we decide to name something, we just name it something. Now, we steal a lot of words from other languages. For example, out in front of the church, you'll notice here a few months ago, we're getting ready to finish it, we started what we call over in Climax Springs, where I was born, a carport. Well, the contractors don't call it a carport. They call it a port -a Well, port -a is not an Ozark word. It's something we borrowed from some other country. Are you following me? And the English language and most languages are a composite of words that are not original, that have evolved from other places. Uh, let me give you another example. At home in my movie collection, I have an old black and white movie. I think Audrey Hepburn or somebody was playing in it. An old black and white movie called The Gay Divorcee. Now back when that movie came out, back in the 40s or whenever it was, what that meant was a lady who had gotten divorced and she was happy. Now, if today there was a movie to come out and it was called The Gay Divorcee, you would be thinking that it was about some divorced lesbian. Now, why is that? That's because the English language has evolved. And what things meant when I was a kid... They don't necessarily mean that now. Now, when I was a kid, my dad said, hey, boy, you're bad. And I thought to myself, oh, that's, I'm going to get in trouble. But now, out in the atrium or the foyer, one of the youth come up to me and they say, Pastor, you're bad. And I go, all right. <laughs> you know. Well, why is that? Because now bad means good. <laughs> See, that's because our language 
has evolved. The Hebrew language was imparted into this earth at least 3,500 years ago, and it was deposited in the earth with a possibility of 2.5 million words. Every word that was conceivable, every word for anything that ever would be named was already available. Now, some of these words, they didn't know what they meant, but the words existed. For example, the modern word for computer that the Hebrews have today, that word existed 3,500 years ago. It's just that 3,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, nobody knew what it meant. They just knew that it meant it was something that teaches you, a learning device, something that imparts for you or thinks for you. And Somebody could have gone up to a rabbi or a scribe 2,000 years ago and, and said the Hebrew word for computer and said, what does it mean? They said, well, it means something that thinks for you and whatever. And they say, well, what is it? And they go, I don't know. That's because it hadn't been invented yet, but the word God had already deposited the word into the earth. Let's go to the next slide. The Hebrew rabbis and scribes and scholars Sages believe that there are 70 layers to the Hebrew language. 70 layers. I like to say it this way, that there are 70 dimensions. Now you think a Rubik's Cube is complicated? Let me tell you something. That's nothing compared to the Hebrew language. One of the layers is the grid format. One of the layers uh, is the hidden Bible codes. One of the layers is this. See, here is the first letter right here in the Hebrew language. That is an aleph. And the second letter is a bet. Now, some people think that the alphabet that we have for the English language uh, came from the Greeks because the Greeks had alpha, beta. Remember your sorority years, you know, alpha, beta. Well, alpha, beta came from the Hebrew letters, aleph, bet. And so every letter has a corresponding number. For example, aleph is one, bet is two, gimel is three, dalet is four, all the way down until you get to the tov, it's 400. And the language itself is mathematical. We'll talk just a little bit more about that. Every letter has a color. Every letter has a time. Every letter has a, a meter. Every letter has a frequency. And this language is so complex, there is no other language on the earth even close. It is the only language without a history Every other language on the earth, English, French, doesn't make any difference what it is, Japanese, Chinese, you can have a person who's a linguist, a person who studies this kind of thing. What a boring job you'd think, wouldn't it? But I guess it would be fun for some people, you know. <laughs> but, but a person who studies this type of thing for a living, you know, they, they've discovered this. Every language has a history. Every language evolves. Every language, you can trace it back somewhere. And you know where the somewhere they can trace it back to? Hebrew. Now... We live in an anti-Semitic world, and the world does not want anyone to know that the Hebrew language was the original language, because generally speaking, around the world, there has been such a hatred for the Jews. Actually, a hatred for the Jews is anti-God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, and he was the Christ. You can almost say hatred for the Jews is the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, I just gave you a few layers there. But uh, let's just say this. There's 63 more. Time is a layer. Oh, my goodness. This, this is the kind of stuff that can give you brain cramps. You know. Okay, let's go to the next slide. This right here is what is commonly referred to as David's harp, King David's harp. King David's harp has 22 strings. There are 22 letters in the... Hebrew alphabet, alphabet, 22 letters. Every string on here 
represents a letter. Every string represents a note over three octaves. Somebody may say three octaves. There's eight notes in an octave, and so three times eight is 24. That's true, but let's say, for example, you have C twice, you know, as they overlap. So there's 22 strings, 22 letters in the Aleph bet. You can actually play notes that are Scripture, and in the notes, there's power. Do you remember the story of Saul? He would have these, these demonic attacks, and David would come to him with his harp, and he would play on his harp. He was literally playing God's language, the alphabet, playing words. The notes are words. More on that. Let's go to the next slide. Creation yearns to worship God. What you're hearing here is nothing more, no synthesizing of any kind. This is crickets, not Buddy Holly and thee. This is the crickets, all right? And with the lifespan of a cricket measured out to equal the lifespan of a human, this is what crickets sound like scientifically. All of creation yearns to worship God. This is going on right now. All the crickets on the face of the earth are worshiping God now. Now, what's interesting, there's a professor in Arizona, Hebrew professor, who has taken the letters, the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and converted them to the notes, to the tones that they should be, to the best of our ability to do this. And when he did this, then they took the notes and they took the letters of the 23rd Psalm and instead of saying the letters and the words, you're going to hear the notes and tones and frequencies of the letters. Next slide, please. This is the 23rd Psalm, as it appears in your Bible. God wrote this music. There's more to your Bible, to the Word of God, than you think there is. Let's go to the next slide. Which, by the way, the, the previous picture of, of Loretta and I, that was out on the West Bank within the last year. We were out there planting some, some vines, and then the picture just before that was a couple little boys in the old city of Jerusalem. And this is the Hebrew professor right here, or the professor of Hebrew, who um, did that. And we have this CD set up in the bookstore. I just put this up here because I knew that some of you might want to research some more. Some of this music and various things are on this. There's two CDs in the set. It's an awesome set. Um, just pick it up sometime, listen to it. You will be amazed at the things he'll talk about that we just don't have time to get into today. Uh, next slide, please. I put this together, this analog and digital with a cassette tape and a CD to remind you of this, that God's language, God's language, the Hebrew language, is the only language on the face of the earth that's digital. Every other language on the face of the earth is analog. Now, what that means is this. Analog, let's say, for example, you, you get a cassette tape of something, 
and you really like this cassette tape. So you put it in your duplicator at home, put the original in the left side and the copy, or the blank one in the right side, and you make a copy and you give it to your neighbor. Then your neighbor likes it. They make a copy and give it to their sister-in-law. She likes it. She makes a copy for her daughter. She likes it. She makes a copy for her neighbor. Next thing you know, every copy is of less quality than the copy before. Every copy is not as good as the previous one until you finally end up with a cassette. And I've heard people say this, how many times has this thing been copied? I mean, this, this is so bad, I can't hardly make out the words on it. That's because it's analog. That's the way our languages are. Languages are just changing constantly. There's, there's nothing precise to it. The Hebrew language is digital. Digital, you can take a, a, a CD, and if you have the right equipment, and you make a copy of the CD, and then you make a copy of the copy, and a copy of the copy, and you do that 400 times, the 400th copy is going to be just as precise and exact as the original because it's digital. Uh, it's like some of the early computers were written in binary code, and they had binary codes even in our computers today, which is a series of zeros and ones. And so you look at a page, and the whole page is full of nothing but zeros and ones. Zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, 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 one, 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 zero, one. And that's what they call binary code. And they convert that into images. Well, binary code, digital code never changes. And I can show you, and I'm going to show you in just a moment, how the Hebrew language is digital. Let's go to the next slide. This right here is, um, well, this is the first few verses of Genesis. Right here we have, uh, now they read from right to left. The Hebrews read from right to left. Actually, you do too. You just don't know it. That's why when you pick up a magazine, you always go to the back page. You do it. You pick up a book, you go to the back page. That's why they started putting indexes in the back of the book, because that's where everybody went to first. Naturally, your natural instincts is to read and write the way God set it up with the Hebrews. Actually, the Greeks changed it around, and you know, some people around the world driving the wrong side of the road, you know, like our friends over in Australia. Red and I are going to be over there at a conference at, uh, um, in Perth in September of next year. And uh, good on you, mate. And they drive on the wrong side of the road. Okay. This is Barashit, Bara, Elohim, Et, Hashemim. Now, this is all we're going to take. This is just as much. Barashit, in the beginning, Bara, what's that? Created. Elohim is God, technically God's plural. Et, Hashemim. Hashemim is, is, uh, heavens, and uh, mime, ha is the, uh, ha shemaim, shemaim is heavens, mime is when we were over in Israel and, and somebody wanted water, you wanted mime. If you wanted a bottle of water, you said, I, I need some mime. And uh, remember the Bible says that there was water in the firmament. God separated the water. Well, when the scribes copy this, when they copy this, what they do is they copy it letter by letter. And if they make a mistake, there is no whiteout. They don't do that. They throw it away and they start over. So they're very precise when they copy. And they're so precise and so honored to be able to copy this that every time they come to the word in your Bible, in your King James or whatever, it will say Lord, capital L-O-R-D in the Old Testament. Maybe you've never noticed this, but in the Old Testament, whenever it has the word Lord, it's not capital L-O-R-D, it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. They honor the name of God so much that they don't say the name of God. And so instead of saying the name of God, they say it's translated Lord. It's actually Jehovah, which is actually Yahweh, which is actually not even that. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But as a scribe is copying, every time he comes to the word uh, Lord, it's translated Lord in our Bible, he does what they call, he takes a mikvah. He goes to, and that's a ceremonial bath. He gets down into the water, cleanses himself. Then he comes back, and then he's purified so that he can write God's name. 
And if you, you have some of those scriptures to say, Oh Lord, our Lord, oh, thou art Lord over, you know, <laughs> I mean, this guy's clean at the end of the day. I mean, he's, <laughs> he, and if he makes a mistake, see, they do not allow mistakes. You say, well, how do they know if they actually made a mistake? And I've heard people say this before, you know, there's mistakes in the Bible. Well, let me tell you something. Specifically in the Torah, or what we as Christians call the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, specifically in that, and more of the Old Testament, but specifically in that, uh, every letter, do you remember me telling you a few moments ago every letter had a, a number? When they copy a passage, what they do is they go back and they convert every letter. This is what scribes do, even to this day. They convert every letter to the number equivalent. They do that for the entire row, and they put the total over here. They do it for the next row, they put the total over here. They do it for the next row, they put the total over here. And every row must equal exactly the numeric equivalent that it should be. Now, then they go back and double check it by counting every column. Every column. And then they do a total of columns and rows. And if this is a fictitious number, but if they come up with 2,921 and it should be 2,920, they scrap it. There's a mistake in it. They start over. I'm telling you, it's precise, and they have been copying it that way. It doesn't matter if you're a Methodist, Catholic, Presbyterian, Word of Faith, or Pentecostal. Every theological school on the face of the earth agrees on this. The Old Testament is without change. Without change. Now, let's go to the next slide. I put this here just to show you something. Um, this is a picture, not of the original, of course, uh, Ark of the Covenant. Have any of you ever seen the, the movie, Indiana Jones and the Ark of the Covenant? You know, what, what was the name of that? Raiders of the Lost Ark? Okay. Um, the Ark of the Covenant was, was a box. On top of the box, uh, of course, inlaid with gold and made a certain way, were a couple of angelic beings with their wingtips touching there. And the lid of the Ark of the Covenant is what in the Bible is called the mercy seat. That's called the mercy seat. Now, when Moses went up on Mount Sinai, God talked to him, and the Scripture tells us that God, over in the book of Hebrews, it tells us that God gave him specifically the dimensions on how to make the tabernacle, gave him specifically dimensions on how to make the Ark of the Covenant, he gave him dimensions on how to make everything. And in Hebrews, we also find out that what he made here on earth, when Moses came down off Mount Sinai, now we, we know and we believe, I personally believe that Jesus met Moses, that Moses went to heaven and met Jesus because of some things it says in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. And somebody may say, well, how could that be? Jesus hadn't been born yet. Duh. Jesus wasn't created when he was born here on the earth. Jesus is, was, will be. He is God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. All right. He always has been. So Moses was shown how to build these things. And in the book of Hebrews, it tells us that what he built here on earth were, and it puts it this way, mere copies of the originals that were in the heavenlies. And in the book of Hebrews, it tells us that Jesus, when he died, remember he came out of the grave, he told Mary, Mary started to cling to him. He said, Mary, don't, don't touch me, don't cling to me, because I have not yet ascended to my Father. One version says, I have not yet been glorified. And then later on, he told his disciples and his friends, he says, go ahead, touch me, feel me, handle me. What happened? He, in between that time, he ascended to the Father. The scripture tells us in Hebrews that he put his blood on the original mercy seat in heaven. And it goes on to say, not the copy, not the copy that was on earth made with human hands, but the original. So he came back, and that's what I wanted you to understand. People get all concerned about where the Ark of the Covenant is on this earth. Well, I'm not concerned about the copy. 
I'm going to heaven. I'm going to see the original. Wow, this is good stuff. Next. Uh, this is something that I, I don't have time to get into, but I think that I, I want to encourage you to study this type of thing. This word right here, what is that, Loretta? What is that word? Shalom. All right. And uh, the first letter is Sheen. That word is sh Shalom. There's so many things that come out of Shalom. See, if, if you're reading your Bible and you see where Jesus said peace, you just think he says peace, like calm down, cool it. He wasn't saying peace. He didn't speak English. He didn't speak Greek. He spoke Hebrew and Aramaic. He said shalom. And when he said shalom, it, he meant all of this. Nothing broken. Everything made whole. No peace missing. Everything right. Everything complete. And many words around the world come from this. In fact, uh, Salem, um, Jerusalem, Jerusalem is the city of peace. Um, many linguists think that the word, the phrase we use here in the United States, so long, is a derivative of shalom. All right, um, let's go to the next slide. Now, we're getting ready for the big finale here. This is going to bless your socks off. I had to put mine on after the last service. Paul was on, his name was Saul, and he was on the road to Damascus. And remember, there was a bright light that came down out of heaven. And out of this light, God, a voice, Jesus, spoke to him. Now, he tells this story three times in the book of Acts. But one of the times when he's telling this story, he, he inserts a very interesting statement. He said, and when we all had fallen to the ground, doesn't say fell off their horses, excuse me, people. All right. <laughs> When they had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying, now why did he add this next phrase? Why in the world would he add this next phrase? In the Hebrew language. It's because there were many languages on the earth. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was an educated person. Greek was the national language of the world. And he's on the road to Damascus, and he hears a voice speaking to him out of the light, which is the glory of God. And that voice could have spoken to him in any language, but he, he specifically said that voice spoke to me in Hebrew. You will find in the Bible that God, when given a choice, now God will speak to you in English if that's all you know. If the only thing you know is pig Latin, God will speak to you in pig Latin. God will, God will come to where you are, and he'll talk to you. But God's language is Hebrew. Now, let's go to the next slide. In John 1.1, 1, 1, the Scripture says, In the beginning, now that sounds like Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, doesn't it? Genesis 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, in John 1.1, 1, 1, and keep in mind, this was written, it was spoken in Hebrew, it was written in Greek. In the beginning was the Word. See that capital W there? That's referring to Jesus. That's why it's a capital. And the Word, referring to Jesus, was with God, and the Word was God. Now, you need to remember this for just a few moments. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, in the Greek language, there are two words that can be translated into English, Word. And you've heard these many times in services. There's rhema, which means the, the spoken, revelatory, revelation word of God. Rhema, for example, in Romans 10, 17, it says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word, rhema, of God. The other one is logos. Logos means the written word of God. Written, the letters on a piece of paper, the the scripture on papyrus, it's the written word of God. Now, strange as it may seem, when it says here, in the beginning was the word, the word there is logos. Jesus here is not being referred to as the revelatory spoken word of God. He is being spoken of here as the written on a piece of paper word of God. Now, 
We know it's talking about Jesus because in verse 14 it says, And the Word, referring to that Word right there, became flesh and dwelt among men. Okay, you got all that? Next slide. There's three different places where it refers to Jesus making this statement. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. You've heard those places. Uh, here they are, right here. He says here, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Now what is Alpha and Omega? Keep in mind, the New Testament, the world at the time the New Testament was written, the world spoke Greek. The Hebrew spoke Hebrew, but the world spoke Greek. It was the commerce language of the day. So immediately the New Testament was translated into Greek and it was spread around the world. So if you take Alpha and Omega, what is Alpha and Omega? Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. All right? But let me tell you something. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus did not say that. Here's, here's why. Jesus didn't speak Greek. Jesus did not say, I am the Alpha and Omega. Jesus said, I am the Aleph and the Tav. Now, Aleph and Tav are the first and the last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And when you are translating what Jesus said into Greek, and Jesus said, I am the Aleph and the Tav, you would automatically, if you're a translator, you would think he was saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. If you're speaking to Greek people, that's the first and last letter of their alphabet. Some of your Bibles, I saw one the other day that even said it more this way. And Jesus said, I am the A and the Z. The first and the last letter of the English alphabet. Okay. He didn't speak English. He didn't say, I am the A and the Z. He didn't speak Greek. He didn't say, I am the Alpha and the Omega. He spoke Hebrew and Aramaic, and he said, I am the Aleph and the Tav. Next slide. Now, oh, this is good. All right. You, some of you are thinking, his message is gone there. <laughs> Kaput. <laughs> just hang on. <laughs> All right. This is what we call, now I'm not trying to just throw out some big words or whatever, but this is a Hebrew-English interlinear Bible. All right. What that means, and you've seen these before, or maybe you've never seen one of these before, I don't know. But they make Greek-English, Hebrew-English, interlinear, here's what it means. They take the the original word in the original language, and then below it, they put what it is in English. You see that? So here's the very first word, badrashit. That's translated in English in the beginning. The next word is bara. It's translated into English, created. The next word is Elohim, which is actually mistranslated there. It says God. It's actually God's plural which is another entire story. It is plural because remember when the Tower of Babel and God said and Elohim said, let us go down and confuse their, their language? Us? How could it be us? Well, it's because it's Elohim. It's plural. Remember in your Bible it says, and God said and Elohim said, translated God, and Elohim said, let us create man in our image. Well, who's the us and the our? Well, we know it's the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We know that. And we can prove that, too. But God is sufficient. Let's don't get confused here, all right? In the beginning, God created et Hashemim, the heavens. You say, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, whoa. There's a word there. And there's nothing below it. There's nothing below that word. Do you see that? Does everyone see that? There's nothing below it. Well, what does that word mean? They don't know. That word's been there for 3,500 years. They don't know what it means. Well, why do they put it there? Well, they have to. It was in the original. And if they leave it out, the numbers don't add up. 
You know, it's not, <laughs> you just don't leave stuff out. Just because you don't know what it means doesn't mean you leave it out. So for 3,500 years, the Jews have been copying this, the scribes have been copying this, and there's a word there, appears two times in the first verse of the Bible. They don't know what it means, so they just skip it. What is the word? The word is et. How is it spelled? Aleph Tav. When Jesus said, he was talking to Jews who knew the Torah, who had memorized it as kids, who had probably always wondered what that word was, the Aleph and Tav, right there in the first portion of the Bible. Jesus said, Jesus said, I am the Aleph and the Tav. Are you getting this? Jesus said, I am the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end. Who was and is. Look at John 1. See, John had a revelation of this. John, the apostle, or John, he, he said, in the beginning was the word. What word? That word right there. Jesus. And the word was, where was the word? Where did he say the word was? The word was with God. <laughs> In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And God is plural, which is Elohim. The word was with God, and the word was God. Are you getting this? <laughs> Jesus wasn't saying, hey, I'm the A and the Z. <laughs> he wasn't saying that. He wasn't like Clem Cadiddle Hopper saying, I'm the first letter and the last letter of the whole alphabet. He wasn't saying that. He said, I am the Aleph and the Tav. I am the Word. I was in the beginning. Ta-da! In, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Hello! And then this word created what's the next thing john said in john 1 1 and nothing that was made was made unless it was made by him so in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and he created all things hello and now the grand finale next slide this right here may look like just a bunch of marks on the page, but the reality, what this is, is the Hebrew writing for the name of God. Now, you've been hearing Kenneth Copeland teach a little bit about this from time to time. You don't hear much teaching on this. But in your Bible, this would be translated Lord. Are you following me? And somebody, somebody was showing me a Bible after the last service, and in their Bible it didn't say Lord, it said Jehovah. Okay? Uh, if, you, if you pick up a Messianic Bible, it may say Yahweh. Now, we're reading from right to left the name of God. Do you remember what I said earlier that every letter, there's four letters here, well, three letters, one of them's twice, every letter means something. Uh, we, we can't go back to it, but that very second slide, one of those columns, things meant something. For example, uh, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet. Uh, Dalet means what? Door. It means door. So the letter Dalet means door. The letter Gimel means what? Camel. Oh, ask Basie. Basie knows them all. All right. Means, means camel. All right. Every letter means something. This is the name of God recorded 3,500 years ago, at least 1,500 years before Jesus was on the earth. The first one, Yud, that means hand. The letter Yud means hand. Hey, this is Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey. Hey means behold. Vav means nail. 
the name of God, the name of God centuries before Jesus ever came to this earth was hand behold, nail behold. Does that remind you of anything? The scripture tells us that God planned the redemption of man before the creation of the world. He, he knew what was going to happen, and he, he created the method of redemption for man before the creation of the world. God put it in his name, the method of redemption. Hand, behold, nail, behold, yud heh vav heh, the name of God. Accident? Do we have an accidental language that God brought to this earth? No. Every other language has a history. They can trace the history back. The Hebrew language has no history. It just appeared on the earth without history. We serve a God that the more science, the more knowledge, the more everything increases on this earth, the more it proves Him. Science does not disprove God. Science proves God. Somebody asked me one time, they said, are you one of those Bible people or are you a scientist? I'm a scientist and a Bible person. Because science doesn't disprove God. Now maybe some goofy scientist tries to disprove God, but science proves God. Science proves creation. Linguists prove God. The more you study this language, the more you realize only God there was a conversation going on a, a while back, and somebody said, well, if it wasn't God, is there any other possibility? Well, if you had an alien race that could travel through time, that knew everything about you and every other of the six and a half billion people on the earth, that, no, it's, it's impossible. There is no way some astronaut from Pluto could have come here and thunk all this up and implemented it. It's just impossible. God knows your heart. God knows you. And God loves you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we praise your holy name. We love you and we magnify you. And Father, we thank you for who you are. And we thank you, Father, for your word. Your word says in Hosea that your people perish for a lack of knowledge. And Father, we know that that means knowledge of you and knowledge of your word. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Somebody might ask this, well, look, there's just no way I can study Hebrew and Greek and all that kind of stuff. Let me tell you something. You don't have to be a Hebrew and Greek scholar. You don't have to be scholarly in all of this. We're not advocating that everybody learn the Hebrew language. What we are saying is this is that you have a basic understanding so that you'll know how it works. You don't have to build a car to drive a car, but you have to have basic understanding of the manual on what makes it work. And I think it's good for Christians to be just knowledgeable enough, at least, so that when some goofball, lame brain, nincompoop, goofy idiot comes up to you and says, you really think there's a God? <laughs> you can nail them because you know. You have the information you know. And it's not just something you think, well, gee, I sure hope so. I've heard Christians do that. I sure hope so because if there's not, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> <You know? laughs> God is God and all creation proves it.